Welcome back to the second half of chapter three, where we're going to focus on the last three parts about the cell membrane, passive and active transport, basically how a cell membrane allows things to go across it. So in our first section, 3.4 on the cell membrane, our goals are to be able to understand the fluid mosaic model of membranes and describe the function of phospholipids, proteins, and carbohydrates in cell membranes. Right away in our opening picture, we have a diagram of a cell membrane of the fluid mosaic model showing the different parts, and we'll be coming back to this. So a cell membrane's job is to separate what's inside the cell versus what's outside of the cell. It separates the living cell from its aqueous environment. That means that cells within us are surrounded by an aqueous environment, which basically means they're surrounded by water and other materials. They're very thin, only about 5 to 10 nanometers thick. They control traffic of other items that are going in and out. A cell just can't exist by itself. It needs materials to be able to come in and go out. So a cell has to kind of be picky about what it lets in and what it lets out. Part of its what we call pickiness comes from the phospholipids that are the major component of the lipid bilayer of the cell membrane. Remember, we've already discussed phospholipids, that they're a lot like other lipids in that they have fatty acid chains, which would be these long yellow tails in the diagram here. But they also, on the head end, have what's called the phosphate group that gives the, or at least that part of the lipid, a negative charge, which makes that part of the lipid polar, which is more of a, like a, characteristic that water has. So that makes that end, the head end, the what you call hydrophilic region or water loving region or polar region. The fatty acid tails, which consists of one that's saturated and one that's unsaturated, are the hydrophobic regions, meaning they fear water. They don't mix well with water. So when you put a phospholipid in water, they naturally congregate like this into a lipid bilayer with the head ends facing to the extracellular region and the intracellular region where there's water, but those ends are hydrophilic or polar, so they don't care. And then the inner regions, the fatty acid chains or the tails, which are hydrophobic, kind of hide and congregate together to try to get away from all of the water that's surrounding them. So lipid bilayers or cell membranes kind of exist naturally because of the properties of the phospholipids themselves. So when I go back to the picture of the cell membrane as a whole, the, the fluid mosaic model, then we see the, the major component then are these phospholipids with the head ends facing outward or to the cytoplasm of the cell, and then the tails facing inward together. Now uh, with the fluid mosaic model, these phospholipids are not just static or stationary in where they're at. They're kind of like floating in, in this area, and they can flip-flop and change places with one another, hence the word fluid that they can move. But what does remain the same is which end faces outward and which end will face inward. The hydrophobic regions face inward together, hydrophilic outward or towards the cytoplasm of the cell. Another part of the cell membrane are proteins. We say a cell membrane is picky, but a more scientific word would be to say that it's semi-permeable, meaning that it only allows certain things to come in and out. And protein channels, proteins, are the molecules that help things come in and out of the cell that can't get across the phospholipid bilayer. 
So things that might have a charge or might be polar or might be a little bit bigger might need to go through a, a protein channel instead of diffusing across the phospholipid uh, layers. So different types of proteins that we might find are transmembrane proteins, also called integral proteins, or peripheral proteins. So I'll go back to the picture here so we can get a visual of that. The transmembrane proteins go all the way through, hence transmembrane, hence transmembrane, and they're also called integral proteins as well. These are great proteins to serve as things like carriers and transporters and pumps that bring things in and out of the cell. Peripheral means on the sides, like your peripheral vision. So peripheral proteins don't quite make it all the way through the whole lipid bilayer. They're found more on the sides, like this one right here in the diagram. So they do not go all the way through, but they do serve purposes that they're loosely wound to the surface of the membrane. They might play a role in cell recognition, like being an antigen or a protein on a cell surface, like an identity marker, or help with the structure of the protein, anchoring other uh, things into the cell membrane as well. So here's a picture of cell recognition. If you're wondering what I'm talking about when I say cell recognition, is that proteins on the cell surface have certain shapes to them, and they can recognize other substances like other proteins or other lipids. And in some cases, like in the picture here, we see them binding together, like fitting together like a lock and a key, which serves as a signal to those two cells. There's another component of the cell membrane. I'll go back to the picture here. You see these little things sticking up here. Those are called carbohydrates, which we've already studied as well. So generally these are chains of monosaccharides, often glucose, and they hang off of a protein or they may hang off of one of the phospholipids like we see here. And that makes up what we call the glycocalyx, or basically the sugar coating of the cell. And uh, they also play a role in cell recognition. In fact, the A and B blood groups have proteins that have a carbohydrate hooking off of them, which gives them their characteristic of being an A antigen or a B antigen. It's not just the protein, it's also the carbohydrate that is hanging off of that substance. Then finally, I'll also mention these little uh, yellow things that you see every now and then, kind of in the center of the lipid bilayer. That's cholesterol, which helps with the flexibility of the cell membrane. Organisms that live in a colder environment tend to have more cholesterol in their cell membranes than those in a warmer environment. So all in all, all of these together make up what's called the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane, describing it as a fluid combination of these different substances like the phospholipids, which are the main component, cholesterol proteins, and carbohydrates. We have one other picture that was included in our book. This is a great example of some proteins on a cell surface. Actually, this is a glycoprotein. And uh, how this protein binds to the CD4 receptor or protein on the HIV virus. How those two are, uh, when they bind together, recognizing each other. Therefore, the virus is infecting this cell. In section 3.5, we're going to take a look at passive transport. Basically, how are we going to get things into or out of a cell that we need? So we'll explain why and how passive transport occurs. 
understand the process of you probably have heard this before osmosis and diffusion and define maybe these are some newer words tonicity and its relevance to passive transport so cell membranes as we as we've already mentioned are selectively permeable or picky about the things that they allow to cross into or out of the cell some things get to some don't and it's greatly in part due to those phospholipids having their hydrophobic tails pointing inward and their hydrophilic heads. Lipid soluble substances are going to move more easily through that and diffuse easily. Other substances that have a charge that are polar are probably going to need a protein carrier in order to get through. Luckily, a component that we really need to be able to transfer into our cells very quickly is oxygen and then carbon dioxide out. Those two gases don't have any charge and move by just nice simple diffusion. So that's good. We don't need any extra energy to get those substances in and out of our cells. And they move by diffusion. This is where particles move from where they have a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Much like if you dropped a bottle of perfume in a corner of a room, then it would diffuse or the particles would spread out. Where you drop the perfume, there would be a greater concentration there, and those molecules would be in motion and would generally keep moving until they spread out and became equally spread. So that's what we're talking about with diffusion, going from high to low concentration. And when you don't need any extra energy for that, that's called passive transport. So diffusion is a type of passive transport. No extra energy needed. We don't have to use any of our precious energy molecules called ATP for that. It just happens naturally, thank goodness. So oxygen and carbon dioxide are some great examples of substances that move into and out of cells by simple diffusion. If you think of it this way, when you take a breath, you have uh, fresh oxygen coming in, so your, your arteries are going to have a greater concentration of oxygen. And when blood travels by your cells who have been building up carbon dioxide, the oxygen is going to go from where it's greater concentrated in the arteries to your cells. And then vice versa, carbon dioxide has built up in your cells, so we'll move out into your, well, it'd be in the capillaries, I should say, which are the smaller vessels where diffusion happens. So both of those gases move by simple diffusion, no extra energy needed to get that job done. And thank goodness, because our cells really need oxygen, and we really need to get rid of that carbon dioxide waste regularly in our bodies. In order for simple diffusion to happen, you do need that concentration gradient, which is a difference from how much there is of a substance in one area versus another area, such as in the capillary versus in the cell itself. Is there a difference? If there's a difference, then we can possibly move that substance by simple diffusion and not have to worry about using any extra energy for that. So here's an example of that. Move my picture out of the way. Here we have a substance with the little blue hexagons, and over time we can see how that substance moves. Outside of the cell, in the extracellular fluid, we have quite a great concentration of those little blue hexagons, and none at the beginning in the cytoplasm of the cell but over time, diffusion happens. They move across the cell membrane until they are equally distributed. They went down their concentration gradient via simple diffusion. So how fast or what is the rate of diffusion? What affects that? Well, first of all, the extent of that concentration gradient Back in the picture, in the this first section, there would have been a great difference from one area here in the extracellular fluid versus the cytoplasm. So we would have had a greater rate of diffusion here 
because of the, the bigger difference between the two areas. Whereas in the next picture, it's a little less, so it would slow down, and finally, then our rate would really decrease when those areas are both uh, pretty equal. Now, not that everything is just going to stop once it's equal or in equilibrium. We're still going to have movement of those molecules across both ways. It's just that it will be in equilibrium then in the end. The mass of molecules diffusing can have a effect on the rate of diffusion. Of course, more massive molecules will move slower. Temperature, a higher temperature means more energy, so that speeds up molecules and therefore increases the rate of diffusion. And then solvent density. As the density of solvent increases, the rate of diffusion decreases. Molecules will slow down because they have to move through a denser medium. Now we have another type of diffusion that does not take any extra energy in the form of ATP energy molecules. It's called facilitated transport. And this is a lot like simple diffusion. It's just that instead of going through the phospholipid bilayer, we're going to have our molecules go through a protein channel. So that protein is going to act like a facilitator and act like a channel for those molecules to go through. They probably need to go through that protein in the first place because they don't mix well with the phospholipid part of the lipid bilayer. Maybe they're polar, have some sort of characteristic that does not mix well with lipids. So they're going to go through a protein carrier instead, but they're still going to go down their concentration gradient from high to low concentration and it's not going to require any extra energy in order to do that. Protein is just going to act as a facilitator and kind of open up, let those molecules go through. So that, again, is called facilitated diffusion or facilitated transport. Another type of diffusion that gets a special name because it has to do with water, which is so important to life, is called osmosis. And water molecules move like other molecules do. They go from where there's more of them to where there's less. So a high concentration of water molecules to a low concentration of water molecules across the semi-permeable membrane. So we found that water molecules can move pretty slowly across a lipid bilayer, across those lipids. They'll go sl more slowly because they are polar. And when they encounter that central part with the little uh, tails that are hydrophobic, they're going to slow down. So they did discover that there's these protein channels called aquaporins that water can move through relatively quickly because then they don't have to come into contact with those phospholipid tails. But still, we're going through the membrane, and we're going from high water concentration to low water concentration, from where there's more water to less water. So the direction of osmosis is determined by comparing the total solute concentrations. And tonicity describes the amount of solutes. And osmolarity is the measure of tonicity. So the total amount, that's the total amount of solutes dissolved in solution. So there's going to be three terms that we're going to use that relate the osmolarity of the cell to the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid. So basically we're comparing two areas. The inside of the cell, the cytoplasm, the concentration there, versus what's the concentration outside. So the word hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic are some common terms used to describe this. So I would like to uh, skip down to a few different uh, pictures here. There we go. First of all, we have this picture showing just regular osmosis. Water going from where there's uh, more water to where there's less water across a semi-permeable membrane. So in this picture, 
we have solutes who cannot get across this semi-permeable membrane, but the pink part is the water. So if we look at the first beaker, we see that on the one side, the left side, that there is more water over here, and on the other side, there's less water. You have more solutes over there. So water wants to go from the left to the right. So then maybe a few minutes down the line, we see this picture happening. We see that water is actually traveling to the right side where there was, there happened to be less water over there before. And so that makes our level of water go down on the left side. So if I was comparing uh, these two areas to one another, I would say that in the beginning here, the left side is a word that we would call hypotonic because there's more water. But and then comparing, usually when we use these words, we always compare two areas to one another. The other side is hypertonic, meaning less water, more solids. Uh, a way I like to remember that is hyper. If I think of a solution that has a lot of sugar in it, it would, and I drank it, it would make me hyper. So sugar, a uh, lot, lots of, it's not always sugar, but a lot of solutes. Oops, it's a uh, hypertonic. So left side was hypotonic, right side was hypertonic. We're comparing those two areas to one another, much like we might compare the inside concentration of a cell to the outside concentration. And then which way would the water move? Water is always going to go to where there's more solutes or to where there's less water. So the water moved to the right. And then our level went down on the left. So again, hypertonic means less water, more solute. Hypotonic was less solute, more water. And isotonic is when the two areas are equal. Not that movement would stop altogether. It would become what we call equilibrium. Molecules would still move. It's just that what moves in versus what moves out would be equal in equilibrium. So some notes on each of those. So let's talk about those. So cells, if you put them in different environments, they have to manage their water balance because of osmosis. Osmosis can be a real problem for cells. So let's think of a freshwater pond or a lake, and we have single-celled organisms who live in those environments. So they're living in basically fresh water with not a lot of solutes, and then inside their cells, they have all these solutes and salts and sugars and things. So that means that they, they have more solutes inside of them than outside of them. And water likes to move to where there's more solutes. So if you're a single-celled organism like a, a paramecium, which is a protist, or an amoeba, or even a bacteria, and you're living in fresh water that doesn't have a lot of solutes in it, you're living in a hypotonic environment. That means that water is going to move by osmosis or diffusion into you. And if that keeps happening, water keeps moving into you, you could burst. That's called cell lysis when that happens. So these organisms literally have to deal with this. They only have one cell, so they better take care of their one cell. So they have different ways to deal with it. A paramecium actually collects the water as it moves in into a big old vacuole and then pumps it out. They have to continually do this. Uh, all day long to save their cell from bursting because they live in a freshwater or hypotonic environment. So they have what's called a contractile vacuole that gets it out, but they have to use energy in the form of ATP to do that. Um, think about plant cells. When you water plant cells, then you put them into a hypotonic environment by watering them. So water will move into their cells. They actually like that, though, because they have that cell wall and the way they're set up. They like that. A little extra water makes a little more pressure inside their cell. It's called being turgid or full. And 
their cell wall will protect them from bursting and it it uh, keeps them from wilting so actually plant cells don't mind living in a hypotonic environment they kind of like it all right and so uh, i'll have some other examples for you as well in a bit but let's go to the hypertonic notes so think about cells who live in a saltwater environment hypertonic hyper lots of solutes lots of salts the ocean or in the sea so that means that outside of their cells they have more solutes out there and then inside their cells they have less solutes and more water water likes to go to where there's more solutes and so these cells could lose water and it could make them literally shrivel up that's called plasmolysis when that happens to a plant cell that can kill the cell as well so they have to figure out ways to deal with that um, so otherwise they might die so for instance shellfish can take up water or pump up or pump out salt to help themselves with that plant cells when you see a plant cell or when you see a plant wilt uh, that means that their environment got too hypertonic you need to water them uh, they can recover up to a point and become turgid again but it all depends how long you let them live without their water and then isotonic is when the solutions are balanced on both sides of the cell. So for an animal cell, that means a mild salt or what we call a saline solution. So you'll notice that the IVs that we use in hospitals, they're not straight water because that would be hypotonic. They are isotonic. They're made of a carefully calculated uh, salty solution just mildly salty to match what the solutions are inside of our body so that when we pump that stuff into our own blood it doesn't cause our blood cells to like lose or gain water so next time you see someone with an IV solution you can say that oh that's an isotonic solution so that their blood cells don't lose water or gain water Again, when cells are in an isotonic solution, that doesn't mean that molecules just totally completely stop. It means they're in equilibrium. The movement going back and forth is equal. So here's some pictures with human red blood cells. What would happen if we put human red blood cells into a hypertonic solution. That would mean putting it into a solution with a lot of solutes, like sugar and salt, and not a lot of water. They would shrivel because water likes to go from where there's more water to less water, or you can also say it likes to go towards where there's more solutes. So these cells would lose water and they would shrivel. Now, what kind of uh, real world application is there for that? Well, this is what can happen to your cells when you're dehydrated. When you haven't drink, uh, drunk enough water, then your own cells can lose water and become shriveled. And that's definitely not healthy. You're not going to be in homeostasis when that happens. Go to the far right and look at the hypotonic environment. What would happen if we bathed our red blood cells in straight water? Well, this is what happens. Cell lysis. This is when cells take on water and they burst. So if you bathe your cells in straight water or used an IV solution that had straight water, that would mean that the wa there would be more water outside of your cells than inside, and the water would want to move into them where there's less water and more solutes. So your cells would take on water and then there'd be so much water that they would burst. We don't have cell walls, so there's nothing to protect. And your red blood cells would stop pop or start popping. And what's going to carry oxygen to all of your cells in your body? So that would mean you would fall out of homeostasis and it could kill you. So a real world application here is uh, could, could this ever happen to you? Yes. Um, in fact, Sometimes marathon runners will try to overload themselves with water. 
and they'll drink uh, gallons and gallons of it before their marathon. And then this happens, they end up in the emergency room and it could actually kill them. So here's what we really want. It's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. We want it just right. And so isotonic is just right. A mildly salty solution, which matches the inner concentration of our cells. And they'll stay nice and happy and shaped just right. So again, cell survival depends on balancing water uptake and loss. With some real world application there. And here's how it looks for plant cells who have that extra added protection of a cell wall. If you don't water your plants and the soil gets hypertonic, this is what happens. Those cells lose water. And here we see the cell membrane shrinking away from the cell wall because they lost so much water to their environment. This is when your plant would wilt. And hopefully uh, you will notice this and save them by watering them quickly. If you don't catch it on time, then it can kill the plant. On the far right, the hypotonic environment, you water your plants with straight water. Uh, they actually like that. Look how it fills up the vacuole inside here. It adds extra pressure. Turg they become turgid, turgid pressure. And the cell wall holds everything in place, and they don't burst. So they actually like the hypotonic environment unlike uh, the animal cell back here when the, they burst. Isotonic is okay, but notice they could use a little more pressure here to make the cell wall kind of go outward a little bit more. So they're okay with it, but they'd actually rather have the hypotonic environment. I guess we can say plant cells are kind of weird like that, right? To each their own. So let's talk about active transport in this last section of 3.6. Not all movement across cell membranes is free. Sometimes we have to pay for it. And how do we pay for it? We use energy molecules called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And adenosine triphosphate can energize those proteins. If I show a picture here. Here's a picture of a protein within a cell membrane acting like a channel or a pump. We would have to use ATP to energize this protein to change shape in order to pump these ions to whatever side they need to be pumped to. So sometimes it costs to do this. So if it costs, it's called active transport. Both active transport and ATP start with A, so that helps me remember it that way. Also the word against, that we're often pumping something against its concentration gradient. So that helps me remember it. Also the three A's, active, against, and ATP. We'll need a conformational shape change uh, with that protein in order to get it to move the stuff to where it's got to go. So one of the, the famous examples of active transport is what's called the sodium-potassium pump. Because cells and membranes contain proteins that are usually negatively charged, or because of other ions that have a, a charge to them, there's an electrical gradient or difference in charge across cell membranes. So the interior is usually electro electrically negative compared to the extracellular fluid. So it's a little more negative on the interior of the cell membrane than on the exterior. And we're talking in relation to those just those two areas. The cell also wants to maintain this electrical gradient. So in order to do that, it has to keep the ions in the right spots, whether they're on the inside or the outside of the cell. So uh, one of the main ways to do that is to make sure that potassium and sodium are in their correct places, their correct concentrations inside versus outside of the cells.
So uh, cells tend to have higher concentrations of the potassium or the K plus ions, and then lower concentrations of the sodium ions. So we usually have more potassium inside the cell than outside. More sodium is outside of the cells. And we want to try to maintain that in order to maintain our electrical uh, gradient. Unfortunately, uh, the membrane is a little leaky to the potassium, and the potassium tends to leak out. So if you get too many of these positive ions leaking out of the cell, that's going to change that electrical gradient. So in order to fix that, the cell has to continually pump sodium potassium all day long. In fact, it's one of the, uh, the ways we use ATP constantly during our day. It's our cells using up ATP to, to uh, make these pumps, pump sodium potassium the correct way. So basically, because potassium is leaking out of the cell, what we're going to do is pump those ions to maintain that electrical gradient. So I'm going to switch to this picture right here, a diagram of the sodium potassium pump. So we have our phospholipid bilayer, and then we have these proteins. It's kind of a combination of an enzyme protein pump. So these little uh, gold circles, those are the potassium. We can see there's more of them in the cytoplasm of the cell, generally. And then we see out here these little orange hexagons. Those are the sodium. So we have more of those outside of the cell. And as I mentioned, potassium tends to leak out, which if we let too much potassium leak out of the cell, that's going to affect the charge or that electrical gradient. So what we're going to need to do is pump these ions. So what happens is that uh, we pump three sodiums for every two potassiums. So if we follow the diagram, what happens is we've got our protein, which is shaped like this, and three, so three sodiums are going to come from the cytoplasm of the cell and bind into that protein into their spots. Then ATP, the energy molecule, is going to bind to that protein and make it have a conformational change and basically push those three sodiums out to where they belong, to the extracellular fluid out here. Meanwhile, while the protein is shaped this way, it receives potassium very readily. So two potassium bind into their spot. That ATP that bound before, that phosphate group, drops off. And then it changes our protein back to its original form, which then drops those potassium ions back to where they belong into the cytoplasm of the cell. So this is called the sodium potassium pump. And it's a great example of active transport where we are pumping these ions against their concentration gradient. And we are using ATP energy to do that. In fact, as I mentioned, that this is one of the uh, ways that cells are using up a lot of ATP in your day, is maintaining the electrical gradient across your cell membrane, the proper charge. Oh, there is another picture up here, of the electrical gradients, how they arise from the combined effects of the concentration gradients and electrical gradients. So going down here, how do we, so that was about moving ions, which can go through protein carriers, protein channels. Those are small enough to get across cell membranes. How do you get big items, large items across cell membranes? So going through a protein or going through, diffusing through the phospholipid bilayer isn't going to work for some things that are too big. Like, for instance, what if you're an amoeba? How, how do you eat? How do you get your nutrition into your cells? So they use a process called either uh, endocytosis or exocytosis. Endo means it's coming in. Exo means out. So that's kind of easy to remember because en, like for enter, 
endocytosis is that it's entering, and then exo, exit. Things are exiting the cell. So this is the using of vesicles and vacuoles to bring things into and out of the cell. So for endocytosis, a single-celled organism like an amoeba or even a white blood cell, when it eats a bacteria or something like that or another cell, a yeast cell, it uses a type of endocytosis called phagocytosis, which the phago means basically eating. And then when sometimes they take in big gulps of fluid that have different solutes in there that it wants, so that's called pinocytosis or cellular drinking. I remember that um, when I think of the wine Pinot Grigio, that you're drinking a fluid. Well, pinocytosis is when a cell is drinking a fluid. So I have some pictures of that. Let's take a look at phagocytosis, which is a type of endocytosis. So a macrophage is a big white blood cell, and here it's eating a bacteria. So basically it takes its cell membrane and it surrounds its food, the bacteria. And then it's going to close off, because remember this is the fluid mosaic model that those little phospholipids can kind of move around. So we can bring in and close off this bacteria into a vesicle by the little phospholipids moving around without ever uh, wrecking our cell. So here comes the bacteria in. Now it's completely closed off in its own little vesicle. Meanwhile, here's a lysosome. We've talked about those. Those are little vesicles that contain digestive enzymes. So the lysosome merges with the food vesicle with the bacteria in it. So again, the fluid mosaic model, the little phospholipids can move around without even wrecking the vesicle. Then those Digestive enzymes get dumped in there and our bacteria gets digested. And then simple diffusion going from greater to lesser concentration, those food particles will diffuse out into the cytoplasm and can be used as nutrition. Sometimes though, what if you want to get rid of big things out of the cell? Then you're going to need exocytosis. You're going to take your vesicle like this one right here, and you're going to merge it with the actual cell membrane and dump it out. So we probably have some pictures of that here as well. Here we go. Let's use this last picture. Here's our vesicle with big particles in it. Here it's moving in the cytoplasm towards the membrane. It touches with the membrane. The little phospholipids move around and eventually they fuse and we can dump out whatever the contents were in that vesicle without even uh, threatening the integrity of our cell, without wrecking the cell membrane. It's very remarkable. And dump that stuff out into extracellular fluid. It could be waste products, but it could also be uh, things that are going to be needed elsewhere in the cell or elsewhere in the body. So ex exocytosis right there. And we have another diagram here, which shows us those as well and kind of breaks it down with some information here. So here we have phagocytosis, where we're eating a large particle by engulfing it into a vesicle. Pinocytosis, where there's some solutes out here that we need. So then we take a big gulp of the liquid, which is going to include some of those solutes, and bring it in. Cell drinking penocytosis. Oh, this one didn't get anything over here, but that one got one. And then there's another one called, uh, it's more specific, that there's these receptors on the cell membrane. And as soon as enough of them get filled with whatever signaling molecule it is, then they will indent downward and form a vesicle so that we have that substance in that vesicle. So it's just, it's a lot like these last two, phagocytosis and pinocytosis. It's just that it's more specific in what it wants. And it won't make that vesicle until enough of them have contact with 
the molecule that they're supposed to be contacting with. In this case, in the picture, it's these little yellow stars. All right, so that finishes up our part B in chapter three about the cell membrane and transport. Again, I always encourage taking a look at the after chapter questions, but since we divided this chapter in two, you'll have to look for the ones that specifically have to uh, go along with that part of the chapter, the second half of the chapter. Like number three here, that one. And here we go, there's some on this, this as well. Like uh, number 11, oops, excuse me, number 10, 11, 12, 13 and 14, I would take a look at. And then in the critical thinking questions, number 18, 19, and 20. All right. Hope you enjoyed learning about cell membranes and transport, and we'll see you next time. Let me know if you have any questions.